how important is singing to you? How important is singing to you? Do you sing personally? Um, at, just so you know, as a pastor, I, I know who sings and who don't sing. Right? <laughs> I, was gonna, just, I was like, grammar wasn't working there, but it works. I watch, and I'm not watching you to judge you. I don't do that. Um, and if you don't sing, that's your business. But how, how important is singing to you? Do you sing personally on your own? Um, sing, singing, songs, music, instruments, the playing of instruments is something that God built into mankind. Many people that won't sing the things of God, they have no problem singing the songs of the world. That's the world, okay? That's fine. But as a believer, songs should emanate from your heart. I want to talk to you about that today. Do you know that even the animal kingdom sings? Even the animal kingdom sings. Frogs sing. What, what, if, if you think of animals singing, what is the first creature that you think of when you think of singing? Birds. Birds, right? Birds are the king or queen of singing. Um, do you know that whales sing? Whales sing. Birds sing. Frogs sing. Did you know that mice sing? Crickets? Katie dids? Bats, squirrels, and I wish I had time to devote a bunch of time to that. Okay, are there any other animals you think that sing? Dolphins. Dolphins. How about some that howl? You think of any that howl at night? Wolves. My dog, Yankee, if you come to my house, he'll bark at you for a while. We've got to give you a treat because he wants to bite you. He's a great dog. My dog. Two of my dogs are great dogs, but they'll bite you if you come, and I, I hate that, right? But anyways... Yankee, if he hears the fire engine, I love when he does. It doesn't happen that often. All of a sudden, he, he leans his head back and starts to howl. Yeah. So he's singing. <laughs> Any other animals sing? Elephants. Elephants? How do they do? Do you know? Is it they're just... Yeah. Um, there's, there's other, do you know that the... I looked up... I know in the Bible it says the trees will sing, right? But I looked it up in other versions that says sings. But the Bible says that the trees will clap their hands. I just want you to know, you, you might say, I don't, it's not natural for me, I don't sing. And there are some people like that. But I want you to know, you are the exception. You are the exception to this kingdom. And I want to encourage you to sing, okay? I don't know about you, but singing has to flow out of me. I, it, it's, it's something that God puts in us. Either the people are singing the songs of the world, or they're singing the songs of something. And I realize some are a musical, if you want to call that. But that's not God. This book is full of songs. You know, someone said there's over 200 songs in the Word of God. This is a singing book. What would be the first place you'd find songs? Psalms. Psalms, 150 songs. But there's a lot of songs in the Word of God. You should do a study sometime. I may do the study sometime looking at the songs of Scripture. But if you say, uh, it's not natural for me, I don't sing, again, you would be the exception to the rule. And I encourage you, let God do something where something will come out of your mouth for Him. It's something that God has built into His creatures. Did you know that God sings? God sings. I'm sorry, Zephaniah 3, I believe 14 says, He will joy over thee with singing. What will it be like when you hear God? This is in context of Israel. But what will it be like if we hear God singing about His nation? If God sings... If the world sings, and the world sings all the wrong stuff, shouldn't we sing? Shouldn't we be a people that lift up a, a beautiful sound to God? The angels sing. Uh, Job verse, chapter 38. I forget what verse it is, but in Job 38. They sang when something great happened. And by the way, singing happens a lot in the Bible when something great happens. What happened when the angels sang uh, Job 38? Does anyone know? The foundations of heaven were laid, and the sons of the morning and the angels of God sang over that what that amaz that amazing thing that God did. Can we not sing over the creation? There's some good songs that we sing regarding the creation. This whole creation will praise God. Now, I'm talking to you guys personally, but how about as a congregation? How important is it for a congregation to sing? Do we just put songs in to fill? You know, I have to work on an order of service each week. Do I just go, well, uh, I need to just throw a song in there? Is that why we do that? No. How many of us sing 
and we just mouth the words and we don't think about the meaning. Every hand can be raised, right? How often? Oh, holy, holy, holy. That's why I spoke up a little bit, because we don't want to sing holy, 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 and just go, I heard this before, and I know all the verses by heart, let's just sing it. Is that how we sing? Is this why we sing, just to fill in spots? Hey, if that's all we're doing, we can cut the service down to 40 minutes instead of an hour and a half. We can cut it down, just come here, here, preaching, and go. Or, but, but let's think of this. Do we just do it to fill in the empty spots of a church service? No. What did Jesus do when he was with his disciples? What does the Bible say? They sang in him and went out, right? Jesus was singing with his disciples. Must be important. It's what God's people have always done from the beginning down to this day. Remember I said when something great happened, people sang. I know in the book of Nehemiah, when the wall was dedicated, they all lifted up praise. When um, You remember this simple little minor incident that happened in Exodus chapter 14. They were being chased by the Egyptians, and they got stuck by the Red Sea. And then the Red Sea opened up. And they went through, and then in chapter 14 at the end, it says Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. What came after that? Singing. The very first time the word song and sang appear in the Bible was Exodus chapter 15. And who did the singing? Who led the singing? Moses, Moses right? And then Miriam led the ladies out to sing with timbrels and dances. If you had been delivered and you walked through a sea, not the reedy sea that was six inches tall, but the Red Sea, and you walked through it, and you watched, you got onto the other side, and you watched the waves crash down and kill your enemies. And those many of the, Jew, uh, the Jews had said, why don't you take us out here to die? And then, bam, you see a marvelous deliverance. Would your voice not be raised? I hope that's how you feel about song. Now, you may not be a totally musical person. You may say, I can't sing well. It doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what anyone thinks. Our hearts should be welling up with, with music to God. However you do it. If you do it at home, in the shower, wherever you do it, sing for God. How important is it for a congregation to sing? It's very important. I want you to know, I'm going to tell you, talk to you about three things. But it's a natural expression of the human heart to its maker. But it's more than that. Through it, God's presence can come upon his people. And God can literally come on the scenes of your life through singing. His very real presence can and has been manifest, manifested many times for his people when they're singing from the heart. I want to clarify. I'm talking about singing from the heart. I'm not talking about mouthing the words. And we'll see in the three areas that we're going to look in Scripture, God's people sang from their heart and God delivered or God did amazing things. But there was other things that happened before that. Let's say that you live like the devil, right? And you don't care about God. And then you come to a church and you mouth the words. Now, again, we all have time when we're not right with God. I'm not criticizing anyone. I'm simply saying, when we sing in that manner, is God going to come into our lives with power? No. And I'm not saying singing is the only thing. If you just sing, you're going to be a good Christian. No, there's a lot more that goes into that. Singing is the whipped cream on the top. You, you've built your life for God, and then the natural outflow of your life that's in order to God is singing, and then God moves in power. We're going to see that from the Word of God. So, God can come on the scene of your life as you sing. God can come on the situations in your life where you need Him when you sing. And God can give strength for your life when you sing. And we'll talk about those things today. God's presence through songs of the heart can and has come into the situations God's people have found themselves in. God's strength also comes to our Christian lives through the purity of singing from the heart. When you're singing from the heart, and it's true, God's going to visit you. All right? I'd like to speak to you today on a forgotten ingredient that is critical to our souls and our church. Just, again, I'm not perfect, and I, when I sing some of the congregational songs, I could be thinking about what I have to do next, and I can forget the words. But I want to tell you, if we as a congregation will be right with God, ordering our lives right, when we sing as a congregation, and George said, can you imagine what it would have been like in the temple when the cloud came in? You know, he, he said that, and I agree with him, it, it hasn't happened like that since. But do you know that God can still come invisibly into our church with the power of God, and it could change our church and change our lives? You have to understand, when I sit up there, and I, I can include myself with it, I think sometimes our song service is a drier part of our service. You know why? We may just be going through it because that's just what we do. 
Okay, the song service should be the pinnacle or the, the whipped cream on the top of our ordered lives. And then when we come together as a congregation and we're singing, God will rush in here and he'll do mighty things for us. So I want to I remind us, because I think it's a forgotten thing, our singing. It's just something we do. But I want to show you from the Bible. Here's my title. It's long, but I'll give it to you after if you need it. The Power and Necessity of Singing from the Heart. The Power and the Necessity of Singing from the Heart. How often do we just mouth the words to a song in church? But I want to say this. Do not admit do not dismiss this integral part of our lives. Do not dismiss singing. I'm going to show you in the Bible that God doesn't dismiss singing. I'm going to show you, and you're familiar with some of these stories, but I'm going to show you how God came and visited his people, not until they sang, but they were doing everything right. They were ordering everything. And if I can make it simple to you, if we order our lives all right, the song's going to come out of our heart, and that's going to be like the, uh, the evidence that we're walking right, and God's going to move in our lives. Okay, and I'm not, you understand, I'm not just saying, singing is the answer. If you, your marriage is falling apart, sing, it'll get better. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, order your life right, and God will see these things. I'm just talking to you about instances that happen through music from the Word of God. All right? So do not dismiss this integral part of our lives. God does not dismiss it. God listens to our songs. Okay? We, we will see it as powerful, and we will see it as a necessity in our lives. By the way, singing is a command. Did you know that? Singing is commanded all through the Bible. But God shouldn't have to command us to sing, should he? It should well up out of our lives. All right? So let's make it come from our heart because of love. But I have three things for us to see today. But before we do, I want to lay groundwork for you to so that you understand about singing. Some verses on this topic. Singing is a natural outcome from the heart of one that praises and is thankful. How do we know God is interested in song? Well, two to three books are, are literally songs. Psalms, Song of Solomon, and some have said Lamentations is a song. All right, so at least three books of the Bible are songs. So it must be important with God. Why do you think it's so important? Because when you see a person sing, they sing from their heart. They sing with passion, even if it's a bad song. It boggles my mind how anyone would like the screaming heavy metal where they're screaming at the top of their lungs. And I thought, how do these guys do concert after concert, night after night? But are they passionate about it? Yeah, but they're passionate about something wicked. But we must know that music is a powerful entity. It drives cultures. Okay? So music is very powerful and it's important. But let's look at the Word of God on singing. And I'm going to hit you some verses and then we're going to be back in 2 Chronicles. Psalm 33, verses 1 through 3. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with heart. Sing unto him with a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. Now, we don't necessarily like loud music, right? When I pull up to the light and that, that sound, boom, boom. And it's like you feel it reverberating in your brain. Or the screaming rock and roll. Or the screaming electric guitars. Is that what David is saying? Play to him with a loud noise skillfully. Why do you think David is saying play loudly? So Help me out here. So people yeah, could hear. But why does he want it loud? It's, it's, it should be exuding. It should be flying out of our lives. That's how important it should be. I'm not saying you can't have soft music, too. David is expressing how important it is to praise God. God receives the... Now watch this. That verse said, he receives the singing of the righteous. Remember, if you're living ungodly and you're singing a tune, do you think God's pleased with that? No. We need to be honest with ourselves. When we're not right with God and we're singing Amazing Grace and we don't even know the words, God's not impressed. Remember, God sees the heart. God sees a repentant person and that music is beautiful to him. So God receives the singing of his people that are righteous, simply those that are right with him. Singing from their hearts is comely or beautiful or suitable. When you're right with God, or maybe you're not right with God and you're getting right with God in your song, God is pleased with that. It's beautiful. It's suitable to him. The psalmist encouraged skillful playing of instruments. By the way, they, in David's times, they didn't go, oh, forgive me, I didn't practice this week. They didn't do that. They were choirs. There was instrumentalists. They had certain times they were going to do this. Certain times they were going to do that. It was organized, but it was heartful, heartfelt too, I'm sure. 
Um, the psalmist encouraged skillful playing of instruments, a new song. By the way, it doesn't always have to be a new song every time. I think what this means is a new spirit, a heart of, because we sing songs we've heard many times. What God is looking for, and you can make new songs, we need new songs, right? But it's the heart of a person singing like, hey, this is, this is my new life in Christ. I'm going to sing about it. The, by the way, the audience of, mu- of this music is God. It's sung to heaven. When we sing, we're not here to entertain. By the way, that's why you don't see entertainers up here. Um, the honky-tonk type stuff, the entertaining type stuff. Or if a person was up here, you know, ex- uh, how should I say, um, exalting their abilities, and we knew it was all over that person, that person wouldn't sing here. Because it's not about us, it's about him. All right? Singing to God, our audience is God. Singing unto God is about him and his praise. The first mention, again, is Moses in singing after the Red Sea, Miriam singing. Isaiah said in Isaiah 12, too, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Jehovah's, when you have God and you've entertained his forgiveness, you're not going to hell. You, you have a home prepared for you in heaven. He's wiped away your sins, past, present, and future. He's dropped them in the depths of the sea. He promises never to bring them up again. That's something worth singing about and singing to that person. God commands our songs to rise. Psalm 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye lands, come before his presence with singing, the Bible says. By the way, all ye lands, God's looking for not just the Jew, but every nation to sing to him. That's Psalm 100. Uh, the thankful sing. Look at Psalm six, or listen to Psalm 6930. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. It's good to sing to God. Psalm 92, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. And to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. All the earth should sing to him. Psalm 96, 1. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Those that have been redeemed should sing. I told you that song erupts when God did something. Remember when Deborah and Barak went out and uh, the man, I forget who it was, Sisera, went into the tent of Jael and she, she pounded a stake through his head. Deborah and Barak sang after that deliverance. The angels sang at the foundation of the earth, as I said. Uh, Nehemiah, they, they sang when the wall was completed. Does your heart erupt with music and song to the one who has forgiven you? The one who died in your place? The one who's preparing a place for you? The one who discarded all of your sins? Think of that. Every sin that comes... Do you ever have sins that come back to your mind? Do you ever have things that you might have done to someone that you just that just drives you crazy? God has taken all those sins and discarded them. Hebrews 8, verse 12 says, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. It's not because God forgets. Do you think God can forget? God's not like us, forgetting where his keys are, forgetting where he parked the car at the Walmart. That's not God. You know what God does? He chooses never to remember. He makes an unalterable decision. You have the faith to turn to Christ, then he's going to do something good for you. And he says, you just repented of all those sins that were breaking a relationship between me and you. I will never bring them up to you again. Isn't that a reason to sing? We should be singing people. All right? So, uh, does your heart erupt with music? I hope it does. In Psalm 40... David praises the one who heard his cry and who brought him up out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and said, He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. David was willing to sing so that others would place their trust in God. Remember, David was in front writing these psalms and, and, and commanding the, the musicians and the priests to sing, and David was behind much of this. Amazing. There's another purpose in song. It is to cause others to put their trust in God. We also know that God uses songs to comfort us. Have you ever been comforted by a song? All the time. All the time. Psalm 42.8 tells us God commands loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night, his song shall be with me. How many have had a song in the night that has helped you? Maybe you woke up at midnight and something happened and you, it, it drew you close to God. We need music. Good music. We need it. It's an invention of God. It's for our souls. And when you couple beautiful music and the Word of God, both of them have the ability to catapult you into a strong relationship to God. Psalm 42.8. How about this one? I love this. Psalm 32.7. 
Many of you may be able to repeat this song, this blessed thought. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. It's a song. Thou art my hiding place. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Then it repeats a refrain. Oh, I hope you let the word of God in song change your life. Singing will be done, by the way, when all of history will be over. Revelation 5 and verse 8, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders are going to fall down. Every one of them having harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. There's going to be a day in heaven when the four and twenty elders fall down. And in your hand they have golden vials. And you know what those are? Those are all of our prayers being saved by God. Isn't that a reason to praise God? He saves my prayers. David said that God bottled up his tears. This is the God we have. He deserves our voice back to him in song. So singing will be done at the end of all of this. Revelation 14.3, the 144,000 sing to the Lamb. In 15.3, the tribulation saints sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. There's going to be a lot of singing in heaven. I would encourage you, if you don't like singing, start to allow, allow God to move upon your heart because you're going to do a lot of that. Yeah, you're going to be perfected and it'll be okay then. But enjoy some of it down here. So here's my point. So singing is evident in God's book. But let's look at these three things and we'll move quickly. Three things. So singing is evident in God's book. But number one, I want to give you some things that will encourage you and help you. Number one, singing from the heart brings God on the scene. Singing from the heart brings God on the scene. Basically his presence. We know that Psalm 22, 3 says, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. What does this word inhabit mean? The word inhabit. To dwell. To dwell, right? Here, here's a, a definition. Webster's 1828, I believe. Think of this in God. Psalm 22, 3. That's the one about Christ being about to die on the cross. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. This word means to sit down, to dwell, to remain, to keep house. If we keep if we sing with a pure heart to him, it's a place he wants to be. It's a settled residence. When you have all your ducks in a row, you're trying your best to live a life pleasing to God. God will inhabit those praises. He'll literally come in. If this church is a church that there's no backbiting, there's no gossiping behind. And by the way, if this church is a place of backbiting and gossip, guess what? God's presence is not going to be felt among us. We're going to feel the opposite. We're going to feel tension. Okay? So... But if you have a church like that, and, and we're unified, we're going to see that in the first section. We're going to see that there was a unified people, and God came in power upon that situation. So this word means to sit down to dwell, to, have a, to occupy as a settled residence. We can enjoy his presence, but it must be pure worship if we want his presence. In this passage, so we're in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, and we're going to, I'm going to hit some highlights, and we're going to hit these two verses and move on. In this passage, it was congregational. It was in the nature of, it was in the congregation. These people came together as one to sing. Okay, so keep that in mind. They were singing together. In 1 Chronicles chapter 5, Solomon was bringing the ark to rest in the newly furnished and newly finished temple. It was God's new dwelling place that came from the heart of David, completed by Solomon, his son, by prophecy. That's the context. In, in verse 2 of that chapter, the chief men assembled. In verse 3, all the men came. In verse, uh, I think it's 4, the Levites picked up the ark and the tabernacle and all the vessels that were inside. Sacrifices began in verse 6. With all Israel there, sheep and oxen, which could not be told or numbered for multitude. In verses 7 through 10, the ark was put in its place under the wings of the cherubim. <coughs> Can you see the probability of God's imminent presence growing? We didn't have time to read those. We don't. But I want you to understand what was going on. David, from his heart, said, I want to build a house for my God. And God came back to him and says, I've never dwelt in a house. And then God told David, you can't build it. Uh, but he says, I'll let your son build it, right? So David's 
collecting all the materials. He loves his God. He, he, and you know what God told him? He goes, you're not going to build me a house, but I'm going to build you a house. God built David a house that the Son of God came through. Think of that. David, in his humility, says, God, can I build you a place to dwell? He says, no, but I'm going to build a house for you. I mean, would you not sing? What, what have we given to God what, compared to what he's given to us, right? So this is a beautiful thing in the heart of David. Remember, Nathan told him, well, you're not going to be able to build it. He actually, he went to Nathan and says, I'm going to build a house for God. And Nathan goes, go, do all that's in my heart. And then God came to Nathan and said, no, tell him he can't do it. So he went back to David and he says, you can't do it, but I'm going to let you help. So David collected all the stuff for the house of God. Then he raised Solomon, and Solomon had the heart to build the house of God. And this is where we are. So the people are right with God. The, the place is completed. He's picking up the ark properly. He's doing everything properly. He's assembling the people. And, you're, and I hope you can see it, but the priests are doing what they're supposed to do. Everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. And then everything falls in line like dominoes for God to visit them with power. So they get the ark in there under the cherubim. Remember, that's where the mercy seat, the mercy seat was on top of the law. That was where one priest is going in one time a year, the whole, the, the high priest, to offer the atonement for the people of Israel. It's amazing what's happening. They were honoring him together. In verse 11, the priest got the ark where it needed to go. They come out of the holy place. Remember, that's God's place. In verse 12, the priests and Levites get ready to sing and play. Let's see it now. Look at verse 12, 2 Chronicles 5, verse 12. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, and Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, picture this, they're arrayed, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them an hundred and twenty priests, sounding with trumpets. Dun, 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 120 of them. Verse 13. It came even to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, watch this, they were as one. The congregation was together as one. The singers were at least, but all the people were there too. It says, It came even the past as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard. And what were they doing? They weren't singing some folk songs. They weren't singing some of the world songs. One sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord... And they said something, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. They're inside the house of God, and there was a fog, a cloud all around them. They couldn't see what they were doing. Can you imagine that? Has anyone, have you ever been in the fog, and you feel literally the moisture of the fog? But these men were standing in the presence of God. Now, has he always been there? But he manifested his presence. Now, do you think it was because they just practiced a good number and it was a nice song that God liked? No. They had done everything that they were supposed to do. And when they did that, they had ordered their life. They did the ark. They did the temple. They did everything in honor to God. And when they put everything together, God says, now I'm going to visit. They, the pinnacle all of it was the praise of their lips to God. And God came to them. Amazing. So it, it came to pass, even as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound. Oneness in praise, unity of heart together is greatly honoring to the Lord. And we see what happens. God comes on the scene. You know what? If we will order our lives right individually, and then we'll come into this place and we won't just sing words, we'll lift our voice in thanksgiving and praise to God. We may not see that cloud. We may not feel that cloud, but you're going to know God is working here in our church. You know what? I, I've watched, and, I, and I've been in many churches, and I think sometimes, many times, our song service is just what we're supposed to do. I hope you'll think a little bit more about this and what builds up to this. All right? So they were as one. Singing God's praises from the heart together is powerful and assures God's going to come on the scene. If we honor him as a congregation, ordering our lives right, individually and corporately, humbling ourselves before him together, he can't help but come and inhabit the praises of his people. Do we need him individually and corporately as a church? Absolutely. His presence cannot and will not be manipulated. Oh, Pastor Dave, you're saying if we just sing, God's not that dumb. If you sing in purity, he's not going to be manipulated. But if we sing from the purity of our heart, 
God is going to visit us. He's going to come on the scene. But if we do as he says, order our lives to be one, making one sound, he will come. He'll not come on the scene in any other way except maybe in judgment. When we won't serve God, he's not here. He'll stand outside the door and he'll knock. But if we're one, he'll come in to our meeting. If you want God on our side, if you want God on the scene of your life, build a crescendo of order and praise in your life. And the pinnacle of your singing heart will no doubt please him. Think of that. Order your life aright. Singing will just be a symptom of the ordering of your life. And then God will come onto the scenes of your life. Do you, do you need him in the scenes of your life? I want God walking with me every step. I want him right here with me every way. But, you know, that's only going to happen as I follow his steps. God can just say, okay, I'm going to step back, Dave. You're kind of doing your own thing again. You know, but if I want God to be in every scene of my life, hey, if something happens to me, I want God there. We know what the Bible says, he'll never leave us nor forsake us, but I mean, we can help that. We can help that by how we order our lives. So that's number one. When we sing from the heart, God will come on the scene. Number two, if we sing from the heart, God will come into the situations in our life that we need. And turn now to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And this is a powerful story. We're going to work through this. Stay with me. And by the way, when preaching it happens, to the best of a pastor's ability, he's trying to engage the people. Sometimes we don't do a good job, all right? But there's also another side of that. You need to engage with the preacher. If you're just coming here for entertainment and it's boring, you're not going to get anything out of it. Try to engage along with the pastor. So I want to read to you about how we can get God, through singing from the heart, how we can get God into the situations in life we need him. Did the children of Israel ever have a situation they needed God? All the time. All the time. And they got themselves in trouble here in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. So number one, Singing from the heart will, God, will bring God's presence. He'll come into the scenes of our life. Number two, singing from the heart brings God into our situations. We need him. And in the Bible, they sang, and when God heard that singing, he delivered. Right? Was it just because of the song? No, because Israel was ungodly half the time. And God's, God would say, away with your worship. Away with it. I don't want to have anything to do with it because it's fake. Okay? When our worship is fake, don't plan on God coming on you in power. Okay, so singing from the heart, number two, brings God into our situation. Um, verse, uh, chapter 20 of 2 Chronicles. I want to read this, but we're going to lack time. In verse 1 and 2, a great army came against King Jehoshaphat and his people. Look at uh, verse 1. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them other beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some to, that told Jehoshaphat, saying, there cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea, on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. So, they're in trouble. In verse 3, he prepares himself and his people. I want you to see, everything lines up, and it ends up pinnacling with the song. But they did everything that they were supposed to do. They, they ordered their lives, and then song was a result of their heart because they ordered their lives, and then the power of God came down. I want you to see that. Don't miss it. All right? Verse 3. And Jehoshaphat feared. Would you fear if an army was coming? Let's say you're at your house and, and, and someone's coming to rob and kill and maim you. Would you fear? Yeah. Jehoshaphat feared. And watch. He's doing something. I want you to be very clear. Just singing doesn't do it. It's the singing from a prepared heart. Okay? And Jehoshaphat feared. Watch. And set himself to seek the Lord. He didn't just do it himself. He called the people together and proclaimed the fast throughout all Judah. So watch what the people did in verse 4. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Remember, this is the divided kingdom. So Judah's coming together. And what are they doing? They're asking the Lord for help. Do you think God's going to fail to help a people who will humble themselves before him? It will not it will always happen, let's put it that way. If God's people, in trouble, purely will come before God, God will answer. He's not going to forsake his people. So they gathered themselves together. Do you think God was interested in what was happening to his people this day? Do you think he started to get motivated to help them? Their attitude started to motivate God to help them. How many times was Israel not helped? When they wouldn't listen to him, God didn't help them. He was always there, but he wasn't helping them the way he could have. In verse 5 through 12, their king prays. Watch the prayer of 
Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? You see his heart? He's about to be possibly destroyed. And so he, he was weak like we're weak. Lord, aren't you powerful? And he said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heaven? And in thine hand is there not power and might? So that none is able to withstand thee? He's scared. So he's calling upon God and said, God, aren't you all of these things? Art, verse 7, Art thou not our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel and gave us it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? By the way, do you notice what he's doing? He's reminding God of all his things. Does God need to be reminded? No. He was actually helping himself. His faith was building, but he was still calling upon God. Verse 8, and they dwelt therein, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil cometh upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house. Remember, that's where we were in Second Chronicles chapter 5. After God did all that in the temple, God, uh, Solomon said, Lord, would you please make this a house of prayer? Would you please make this a place that people pray to you? Even if they're in another land, if they'll pray towards this house, will you deliver and God answers this prayer, and he answers it again and again and again, because God is a God who will answer the prayers of faithful people. All right? If when evil cometh, verse 9, as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house, and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. Now, do you think God wanted to help? Yes, but he's not helping yet. He's seeing, he's, he's testing these. Uh, the production of righteousness is being produced in their lives. The table's being set for God to swoop down and help them. And now, behold, the children of Ammon, verse 10, and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. He's saying, hey, this nation we couldn't destroy. You wouldn't let us. Now they're after us. Verse 11, behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. They have no idea how to get out of this, and they go to the Lord. Amazing. That's 5 through 12. In verse 13, the people, watch this, they're waiting on God. Their king has prayed, and it's like, they're stuck. say, God, we're going to wait. Will you please do something? Look at verse 13. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Picture God. Here's his people. They're in trouble. They call on to him. They're right with God. And the, the fathers and the mothers and the little children are waiting. God, what are you going to do? Are you going to help us or are we going to be annihilated? I love this. Then God answers. A Levite, one of the sons of Asaph, Asaph being one of King David's chief musicians. Interesting. This man comes from the line of singers. Speaks prophetically an answer to the prayer. They prayed and then they stopped and they waited upon God for an answer. They had nothing they could do. This army is advancing. Verse 14. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came, upon him came the spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. He probably didn't know what he was going to say. God, God moved upon him. Hey, speak to these people. Verse 15, and he said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou king Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. They're preparing their heart. We're going to see what their song does. Verse 16, Tomorrow go ye down against them, and behold, they come up by the, hill, the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. Jeruel. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Wow. Watch this. So, the prophet speaks. The whole, what does the whole congregation do next? Look at verse 18. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. You think they're doing the right thing and you're getting his attention? Absolutely. Verse 19. The Levites now stand up. All the nation bows down. The Levites stand up. Verse 19. The Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korites stood up 
to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. In verse 20, Jehoshaphat and the people went forward with his encouragement. Now he's encouraged, and he's encouraging his people. Verse 20, and they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they stood forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. So shall ye be established. Believe his prophets. So shall ye prosper. Believe the men of God. So then he goes, uh, then he, then we see what the, happens next. Verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy in the earth river. How many armies have you ever seen? They start out with singing. He was told, you're not going to fight. I'm going to take care of this for you. What else could come out of their mouths? And he said, he appointed, he consulted with the people and he appointed singers unto the Lord. And he told them what they should do. Praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the Lord or before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Amazing. They should not fight, but they should sing. He appointed singers. Can we get God's help if we sing in an ungodly manner with ungodly music, with ungodly hearts of this world? No, nope, it's not going to happen. You sing the Christian rock or all the, the Christian music that's an offense to God. God's not, God's not in that. But they needed God in their situation, so they did it honorably and right. Can you see their help looming? Can you see the help of God looming? Can you see the intensity mounting? Look what happens in verses 22 through 30. And when they began to sing, watch, when they began, God, they were building, doing the right thing, doing the right thing, but God didn't deliver until they did this. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy one another. And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, they were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found them among them in abundance, both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And there were three days in gathering of the spoil that was so much. And on the fourth day, they assembled themselves in the valley of Baraka, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of the place was called the valley of Baraka unto this day. Then they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them, to go again to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord hath made them to rejoice over their enemies. And they came to Jerusalem with psalteries and harps and trumpets unto the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on all the kingdom of those countries when they heard that the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest around the belt. Did they say, man, that was an awesome battle. All these countries were fighting each other. You know who they praised? They praised the people that didn't do anything. Because they knew God did it. All right? So God honored them and honored them what was a result. They were blessed and spared. They had their enemies' riches and other kingdoms feared because God had fought for them. God can and will come on the scene if we humbly obey and honor Him with our ordered lives. God will help us in our troublesome situations if we honor Him too. Singing together brought God's protection. Singing is the pinnacle of our ordered lives and He loves to inhabit His people's praises. It was... It, it's like when a child cries to his father, he'll rush to his aid. Quickly and lastly, number three, singing to ourselves and believers around us brings God's strength to our souls. If you would, turn to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. We're just a few minutes away from being done. Ephesians chapter 3. So singing brings God onto the scene. Pure singing, together, united singing brings God onto the scene. Pure singing brings God into the situations of our lives. And again, singing is not the, the avenue. Singing is the symptom of a right heart that God will respond to. So number three, singing to ourselves. So now they, they sang to each other and to God. But now we're singing to ourselves. And we're singing to others around us. That brings strength to our soul spiritually. This one strengthens us individually and also as a church. Now, I want to read to you the verse... And I'm going to be pretty straightforward. And don't take it bad because I was a product of all this too. First, uh, uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 19. 
speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This does not say singing to yourselves in country, hip-hop, rockabilly, um, death metal. It's not what it says. It's not rap. It's not jazz. It's not that. If we're going to be filled with God, we can't fill our lives with all that other stuff. Remember, in Matthew chapter 6, you can't serve two masters. I'm not criticizing. I was a lover of music. I'm still a lover of music. But when I got saved, I said, I can't do that anymore. I can't listen to this stuff anymore. Because it divides my heart against God. That's between you and God, what you do. But I can't fill my life with rock and roll and be filled with the Spirit. It just it's, They're two different things. You're serving two masters. Okay? That's me. And I think it's biblical. All right? So Ephesians 5 is not talking about that kind of music. It's talking about speaking to yourself. Now, you're speaking to yourself through song. You're actually teaching yourself by song about God. Speaking, if, if singing to God can bring him on the scene of our life, if singing to God can bring him in the situations in life, speaking to our hearts with psalms, spiritual songs and hymns, that can strengthen us as believers. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The context of this chapter is how to walk wisely in the time we are in. You see the same building blocks as we saw in the two other examples. We are to be followers of God, Ephesians 5 and verse 1. We're to walk in love like Christ did, not once being named as a fornicator, covetous, nor filthy, nor foolish talking, not having fellowship with the works of darkness. We're not even to speak of those things. We see that in this chapter. We're to wake up. We're to walk circumspectly and redeem the time. We're to be full of the Spirit. All of those things are pinnacle things like we saw for Solomon and we saw for Jehoshaphat. As we're building these things into our life, then when we speak these songs and we dwell on God, put strength in our life. See how it's similar to the other passages? The singing is the whipped cream on top of a right heart and life. It's a culmination of a life lived for God. It says speaking to ourselves in psalms. What are psalms? God's word in song. There's a lot of good doctrine and, and, and beauty in the psalms. We sing those things. Many people pray the psalms because they need the strength of those songs. Hymns, what are hymns? They're songs of praise to God. What are spiritual songs? David Sorensen says spiritual character place to Christian music. There's a song that we sing. Um, Take time to be holy for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you some other do it. That's a spiritual song. Helping you to focus on doing right. So songs, hymns, spiritual songs. Uh, it's, it's character building music in distinction to carnal or worldly type of music. This verse talks about speaking to yourselves by way of music, the truth of the psalms, the truth of the hymns, the truth of spiritual songs, singing and making melody. What is melody? Anyone know what melody is? Um, here's a definition I got. A pleasing succession of sounds. When we sing, you know that we make a pleasing sound to our God. This is a result of a spiritual life. Now flip over, and we're going to conclude in the book of Colossians. Flip over a few pages to the book of Colossians, chapter 3 and verse 16. Colossians 3 in verse 16. Now, we'll see what this scripture has to say. In verse 16. I'm going to stop in the, towards the beginning. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. What does the word richly mean? What does the word richly mean? Abundant, Abundant right? It says this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This is a result of a spiritual life, this song. Does the word of God dwell in us richly? Does scripture hold, does scripture hold an abundant place in your life? If scripture is an abundant thing in your life, it's going to come out of your mouth as music too. Is it the word abundant? Uh, the word um, Richly means abundant, a magnificent, uh, plenteous. So I ask you, does Scripture hold an abundant place, a magnificent place in your heart? Is your heart plentifully filled with His Word? Or does something, or does anything else fill your heart? Are the music of this world... How many have heard a worldly song that you used to like and you can't get it out of your mind? How often does a, a, a hymn do that? It, it does, but the world has a big pull, right? But what fills your heart? The Bible says to let the Word of... Christ dwelling you richly. And it goes on. 
But do you see that a man that lets God's word fill him richly will have wisdom? But we are also to teach and admonish. We're to warn each other with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We are to sing with grace in our heart, favor, goodwill, and kindness. If we come together as a congregation, right with God, right with, with each other, trying to help one another with scripture and his songs and our, on our lips and in our hearts, will God fail? If we come together as a group and God is on our heart, God is on our mind, not, hey, I can't wait to get to church because I, I need to rip somebody. I mean, what if we come to church with the song of God in our hearts? What if we're right with God? What if we're encouraging one another by admonishing, by hymns and song? What if we actually are encouraging each other instead of beating us down? Guess what? Our church will be powerful. Our church will be powerful. But we're to teach and admonish with these things. If we come together right with God, right with, other, with each other, trying to help one another with scripture and the songs on our lips and in our hearts, will God fail to help us achieve the aim of this verse? No. The thrust of this verse will happen in our lives. Songs are given to encourage uplift and warn. We're closing with this. Remember the song at the end of Deuteronomy? At the end of Deuteronomy? God told Moses, Deuteronomy 31 and 32, he told them to write a song. And he said, make the people remember it because they're going to forsake me. And he forced the people to remember so that it would be a witness against them. Music is used to warn us, to uplift us and encourage us. That song was for a witness from God against Israel. May we understand that singing from the heart as a congregation can bring God on the scene right here in our church. It can bring him on the scene of your life. It can bring him into the situations of God that we need him for. And and it's singing from the heart, spiritual song, scripture into our life will bring strength to us. So if we do these things, if we order our lives individually right and have all our ducks in a row, corporately, we will have him move visibly in our midst. We'll have him present in our lives and in our services, seeing God change lives. May we as a people be one in prayer so that God can deliver us in any situation we come to to see his protection, but also singing from the heart, meditating on his word together so that we can be strengthened and see God produce what he wants. Amen? And I ask you, what are you filling your heart with?